You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. We are so pleased that we're joined today by Laura Richards, fellow podcast colleague, host of Real Crime Profile and Crime Analyst. Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. I'm really happy to be here. We're so excited because we feel like we've known you for years and we look up to you on so many different levels. Your mentor, whether you realize it or not. We're just thrilled that you have time, especially with your new arrival at home, Rafi. That's so sweet of you to say. Thank you. Yes, I'm thrilled to be here. And we spent a lot of time talking crime, all of us at CrimeCon and various other places and uh, podcasts. I'm really pleased to be on your podcast, which the acronym MOM seems very fitting for me right now because that's my (laughs) new and greatest achievement of all time, which my little guy Rafi. Tell everybody how old he is and what he's doing and all that kind of good stuff because he is an extremely important person. He really is. He is five months old, actually, this week, and he's adorable. He is a little ray of sunshine. And yes, he right now he's next door playing and you may well be able to hear him very soon. May even make a guest appearance. We'll see. (laughs) But yes, he's a total joy. And I were just thrilled to be pregnant and then welcome him into our lives. If he isn't the cutest baby in the world, he's definitely in the running. Oh, very yes. smiley, very smiley. Every picture you've posted, I'm like, look at that grin. It is beautiful. He smiles a lot. And I have to say, even when I'm feeding him or when he's asleep, he smiles and he giggles. It's just amazing. I, I just don't know what's going through his little head, but it is just absolutely gorgeous. And it's contagious and infectious and just melts you every time. One of the most interesting things about being a parent, and for me, we had our son Christopher now 23 years ago. It feels like about five minutes ago and 20 plus years ago is watching someone who's never lived on this planet before. And in their first year, they're going to learn to walk and talk and interact with all of these people on this giant planet that they've joined. And think about we're all busy and a lot of great things will happen to us this year, but more things are going to happen for Rafi this year than any of us as adults could ever ever pack into 365 days. He's five months into this fascinating journey. He is. It's a little psychology experiment, watching him learn everything. And just, he is so awake. He watches, and from the day he was born and placed on my chest, his eye contact with me was very intense. And everybody said how he tracked everybody in the room. He's always been this baby that just takes everything in and is learning. He tries to mimic me when I say hello. He's doing everything at least a month, two months before all the milestones which it's incredible just to watch. He's already trying to stand when I just popped out. He pulls himself up and he's already trying to get his legs down, which of course is far too young to be doing any of that. And of course, once that happens, I better get fit again and get my runners for quite a while, I think. (laughs) It's all over. Let us steer into some nuts and bolts questions. And I'm sure Rafi will come up or introduce himself as the conversation unfolds. (laughs) But Laura, let me go ahead and have you start by talking to us about your educational and professional background. The thumbnail is that I specialized in forensic and legal psychology. But in terms of where I worked professionally, I actually did my specialization, did my master's at the time I was working at New Scotland Yard. The two together actually work very well if you can bear to work a full day and then work in the evenings as well, because it is tough. And at the time I was working tiger kidnaps and cases that ran on and on and through the night. So it was a challenge, but I'm trained as a criminal behavioral analyst. I've had the privilege of working at New Scotland Yard for a decade. 
and also being trained by the FBI. And I think I'm probably one of the few, actually, who have worked in both places and spent time at Quantico, attended all their training and delivered training as well worked with and been trained by some of the best across the world. I also say that I'm an author because I've written books on policing domestic violence for the police, as well as an advocate, podcaster, and producer. And now I can add mum to my, which is probably, <laughs> like I said, my greatest achievement of all. And I probably shouldn't forget eight-time law reformer and campaigner, having changed laws in three countries, which I am very proud of. Yes. Did you want to get into law enforcement and the kind of analysis that you've done in your career back when you were a kid? I think when I look back, I fancied myself much more in criminal law, actually, and then realized that from watching shows like Perry Mason and various influences, realized that actually, did I want to defend people? Mm, Not sure I could do that. Did I want to prosecute cases? Not sure that was quite for me either. And I think probably the influence of Nancy Drew, the Hardy Boys, lots of things that I read. And then thinking about Jodie Foster and various influences in the parts that she's and roles she's played. Yes, it seemed to be sensible for me, actually, being a very curious person to start with psychology. So starting with psychology and then thinking criminal psychology And I managed to talk to lots of people at New Scotland Yard and see if I could get a what was called a college based sandwich student role, which most people thought that I was making sandwiches for people at New Scotland Yard. But it was actually a year out before I sat my finals in psychology. I spent a year at New Scotland Yard and and that work within the sexual offences section at New Scotland Yard in their intelligence branch really solidified for me. That's what I should be doing. It seems my, the way my brain worked, the questions that I asked, not necessarily the culture, that was something that I found quite difficult to work within, but I certainly in terms of the work itself and the challenges and being a curious person, I really wanted to carry on that analytical role. And so that's really where my career began. And having done a year there and went back to sit my finals at university, my then boss asked, would I go back to New Scotland Yard and would I head up the unit, the sexual offences unit? And rather than go off on a year traveling, which is what I intended to do a year (laughs) out, how could I pass up that opportunity? So back I went, having been the student in the unit to head up the sexual offences section. That is amazing. So having worked at both New Scotland Yard and with the FBI, like how similar or dissimilar are the two organizations? I'm very curious how it works over on the other side of the pond, if you will, versus how it works here. Yes, I think the perception of what they both are. Most people have this perception that, for example, the FBI and the behavioral profiling units, while they watch criminal minds and they think that's criminal minds and everyone flies around on a jet, right? (laughs) The same for New Scotland Yard. They see this flashy triangle and it sounds really shiny and polished of New Scotland Yard. But I remember when I first walked through the doors and I was like, wow, these lifts are really nice. But once you get behind those lifts and you get into the belly of the building, you're like, oh, okay, this isn't quite what I signed up to. I thought these nice flashy elevators or lifts, as we call them, So it was just corridor after corridor in a maze that you'd get lost in. So I think they both share this sort of perception that you have a Garcia sat behind a keyboard can tap into any database. That doesn't happen in real life. I think that for me, New Scotland Yard would always say they're the best in the world, where the FBI would say they're the best in the world. So there's rivalry and competition. I think that's a healthy thing to have. But in terms of culture, the FBI is quite different because you can't just walk into the FBI. You have to have some other trade or some other craft, Mm -hmm. some other degree, some other specialism before you go through the doors. New Scotland Yard, it's really the headquarters for the Metropolitan Police Service. And really, when you look at the recruitment process, anyone can join. And actually, the culture is one of when I joined, they understood if you were a typist or if you were support staff, but they didn't understand if you had a specialism, particularly if you're a female and particularly if you're a young female and an unwarranted officer 
they didn't like your kind there. That's what I mean. The culture is very different. Whereas in the FBI, when I worked there, I felt I was in exactly the right place that I should be in around peg in a round hole of other people with all these specialisms. And I had a specialism and really interesting people, probably in the behavioral units, the 1%. They've all traveled. They speak multiple languages. They've all they're incredible people. So I think the cultures actually are very different. I wanted to ask about something you just mentioned, Laura, which is when you started, were there a lot of women at New Scotland Yard? Were they respectfully beyond just support roles? You use the word typist, which is uh, here in the States, we might say secretary, although that nomenclature has kind of gone away. Were there a lot of women in leadership roles and investigative roles and analyst roles? Absolutely not. My career started 26 years ago and you did have women in tradi- the traditional roles, support services. And of course, women did join, it was always called the job, the police as well, but fewer in numbers and certainly not in leadership roles. Although that having been said, across a number of years, then you started to see some women populate some of those leadership roles. But I'm talking really detective inspector, detective chief inspector. Above that rank, you didn't really see females. And it was very much, I have to say, the old boys network. Most of the business was done before you even sat down in the meeting room, unbeknownst to me. And then you start to figure these things out. So the culture has changed. Uh, Unfortunately, New Scotland Yard and the Meta and the media at the moment a lot, because there was a murder of a young woman called Sarah Everard. And I mean, at the time, it grabbed media headlines because she was white, blonde, went missing, literally just disappeared in Clapham. And actually, my neighbours had said to me, I've still got a property there. This young woman's gone missing. Can you post about it on social media? Because it was in the locality. So I was already posting about it. But the short story about that horrific case is that it turned out to be a police officer, a serving Met police officer called Wayne Cousins, who had not only abducted her, but he under sort of the ruse that she was breaking COVID rules, but he went on to rape and to murder her. So the Metropolitan Police were very clearly in the media spotlight. And then it's come to light subsequently A number of other officers are under investigation from the same unit for raping multiple women. And there's just been a very damning report written about the culture that has appeared in the media just this week, talking about the misogyny, the sexism, the racism, the homophobia, all the things that I experienced, unfortunately, and saw. So in terms of the actual culture itself, it very much is being talked about right now and quite rightly. And I have to say, when I was at the FBI, I didn't experience any of those things firsthand. That, again, was why it was quite different in terms of Mm. culture. But I think it is important to mention these things because they do happen, namely because of who those cultures attract. And so it hasn't really attracted many women. And having said that, the head of the Metropolitan Police Service right now, the commissioner is Cressida Dick, who is a former mentor of mine, and she's in that leadership role. She's had a lot of crises to deal with. But in terms of her top team and other people that she's got in very senior positions, many of them are women, which is definitely a good thing. So some people are saying, oh, in the culture where you've got a female leading the organization, all these terrible things have happened. You can have the best leader at the top and you can put in place leaders you know, below you. But a culture is something that takes a huge amount of time to change, doesn't it? And the people that you attract, a lot of people are questioning their selection process. Have they got the right people that they're attracting? And I think they really do need to do something about that because The culture currently, people seem to think it's acceptable to send WhatsApp messages that are hugely sexist. And quite frankly, those individuals who are doing that and have been exposed, they shouldn't be in policing. The things that they're saying, women deserve to be killed by men and that they like to be beaten and they enjoy being someone being violent to them. And that's why women are being killed because they enjoy being with those individuals. And these things are open messages on WhatsApp groups. They're not even being hidden. And of course, when you look at the domestic violence rate, and when you look at the lack of rigorous investigation and charges and convictions, you have to wonder about the people who are in those positions, gatekeeping cases going through to the Crown Prosecution Service. 
So yes, it, these are very real issues. I think the, it's not just about the Met; it's about all police services and all across the world. Who do you attract, and what's the leadership? What's the culture? And most of it is about attitude and aptitude. And are people calling out the wrong? And there are some fantastic police officers in the Met as well, and across the world who also tear their hair out at it. But you've got to speak up, and otherwise, the silence allows the stuff to and people to carry on doing what they're doing. So I want to see more women in policing in all roles, as well as diverse recruitment. Long you, answer, sorry. But no, it's, no. it's on my mind <laughs> no, at the moment it's because great. it's in the news and people ask me about it all the time. No, it's a fantastic answer and it's an important issue. And I think both of us find ourselves just shaking our heads because yeah. situations like this current scandal in the UK they shake everyone's faith in law enforcement. So if you're a victim of domestic violence, are you going to hesitate to pick up the phone, to call, mm -hmm. to report your partner, whomever is abusing you, knowing that there are forces within law enforcement that not only don't care, but are probably actively in the abuser role? It seems to just shake the foundations of the trust that we need in law enforcement. Absolutely. And it's happening all across the world. Yesterday, I was looking at the case that's happening right now in Bridgeport. And I don't know if either of you have been looking at Lauren's case. Let me just find her name. But Lauren Smith Fields, where she died. The police didn't contact her next of kin. And she'd been out on a bumble date the night before. The shocking, there's just so many shocking things about this case. The fact that next of kin, her mom didn't know what had happened then questions were asked, well, are you going to speak to the man that she went out on a date with who had called it in? And the police officer said, well, he's a decent guy. So no, evidence wasn't seized of bloody sheets and sedatives and used condom. And questions are being asked by the mother about that. They've ruled it accidental death. But the mother said that she never took drugs and these drugs are a sedative. So questions have to be asked. Now it's come to light that another woman before her had died just weeks before, and the next of kin weren't informed. The mayor's now stepped in and is saying that those officers have been suspended. That's great. Does race have anything to do with it? The mother says yes, because mm -hmm. Lauren was black and she said she was on a plant-based diet, looked after herself, went to the gym all the time, never did drugs, and is questioning, well, they're putting in a legal complaint about the way the case has been han handled. So again, I can't say anything more about the detail of it. It makes me want to ask the questions. Who was the Bumble guy? Was he white? And therefore, he's a decent guy. And because Lauren's black, is it just written off that, oh, she must have done drugs without asking any questions about her lifestyle and her behavior? And quite frankly, that's not acceptable. That was 2021. This is going on all across the world. And in particular, when it's female victims, sometimes the cases are not taken as seriously and they're written off or written up as something without asking any questions at all. And assumptions are made about the potential suspect as being a decent guy, which is unacceptable. So I'm seeing it across the globe in Australia as well. And it's the perceptions that people have. It's then the media framing of the victim and how then that transpires that people then think this case is about X rather than Y. And that's why Crime Analyst, my new podcast, is so important because it is about being curious, asking questions and trusting your instinct. And I'm hopefully helping people become better advocates for themselves and not just accept when you're told something by a professional, that's all there is to it. And I think that's really important that we need to trust our own guts and judgment when things are going on and not just take the first answer that we get maybe from the first officer or the first doctor. And to be able to advocate for ourselves, I think is a very important thing. Since we're on the topic of crime analyst, you want to talk to us a little bit about it? What ultimately led you to form? It's your second podcast. You also are working RCP, Real Crime Profile, for those of us who are not familiar with it. What led you to decide, you know what, I think I need a second podcast? I would love to talk about Crime Analyst. Yes. I'm sat here with my new water bottle and I've got a t-shirt <laughs> on. I love it. I've got a hat. I'm just trying out this merch at the moment. Oh, I seeing, love it. And Rafi seeing, was spotted wearing a Crime Analyst onesie. Yes. 
He was in his onesie yeah. modelling and Beatrice's <laughs> merchandise is on its way. We're going to, and Umberto's going to get his. We're going to be a full family <laughs> there you crime go. analyst affair. <laughs> I love um, it. Yes. Thank you for asking that question. Real Crime Profile is a great podcast that where we put the victim's narrative at the centre and Jim and I talk about real cases and Lisa brings her experience around casting and criminal minds. But Crime Analyst is really the baby I wanted to also give birth to. And funnily <laughs> enough, what I would advise is if you are a pregnant, don't launch a podcast at the same time. <laughs> two things, a sentence, they, they should never be in the same sentence, those two phrases, and certainly not happen in real life. But uh, yes, I birthed two wonderful beings, crime analyst and Rafi. And really the thought behind crime analysts is that people know the police officers and the detectives and the profilers and the CSIs, but they don't really know people like me, the geeks that are sat behind the scenes in intelligence cells doing all the geeky stuff and actually would far rather be in the shadows, which is what I spent 10 years at New Scotland Yard doing in the shadows in an intelligence cell. But I really wanted to firstly reinvestigate cases. And I started with a reinvestigation that really the case ended not too far before my career began. But what I was told the case was about actually wasn't what the case was about at all in the policing culture. So I started with a reinvestigation and I wanted to show people the process, the painstaking detail that you go into when you're really analysing a case. And it's not CSI and it's not criminal minds and going through that process and not to be condescending or patronising, but to talk through the process and the aha moments that you get. So to be very authentic and in those moments. The other part, I've got three strands to it, the reinvestigation, the specialist report. So as I'm changing laws and I'm involved in the serial perpetrator campaign and Australia, Queensland and New South Wales now declaring coercive control will be a criminal offence. I want people to hear about those things and get behind law reform because my listeners are in Australia, the UK and the US and Canada and various other parts of the world. So that they can be activists and be part of creating change and a tipping point. And the third part is something that I've just launched called My Two Cents, which are really quickish reactions. Not that there's anything quickish about analysis. It is a slow, labor-intensive process. But my quick takes on Mm. shows like The Puppet Master, which is just on Netflix, where a lot of my listeners say, I keep thinking of you. I'm watching this show. And I keep thinking, what would Laura Richards think about this? (laughs) And so I'm really just capturing that and being able to churn out. This is what Laura Richards thinks about this. Whether you agree (laughs) with it or not, these are my thoughts. 20 minute kind of quick analysis of what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing. It's fascinating. And these are things as topics that you can discuss in a fairly concise manner. In other words, you're not going to devote three or four episodes of Crime Analyst to a particular television show or whatever, but you are going to offer your perspective. Quick thoughts, yeah. And it's not easy to do that, to make it a 20 minute, but I think there's still some very useful things you can say and signpost people. For example, the puppet master, why people were very interested in my view was because a female FBI agent, Jacqueline Zappacosta, is sat talking to camera and she says, this case is all about coercive control, which I jumped off my sofa at that point. (laughs) um, (laughs) Yes. Because it was... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's what I've been working to. And it's a case It's a case that I haven't been involved in. And I didn't do any of the TV consultation. I wasn't involved in any way. And when I did Dirty John, that was my whole ethos and rationale for a mission for doing Dirty John to name check, make sure people understood coercive control. Now I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it in Sophie Tosca and Duplantier's case with the Netflix show and now in Puppet. And that's the whole point that you can change laws and therefore people understand, OK, we've got this thing called coercive control. But you want to get it in the popular zeitgeist and the narrative because someone might be sat there with it happening to them. And when they see it on screen, that's me. That's what's happening right there. Yeah. And then they may do something about that. So you have to do all of it together, which is why my career has always been so busy, because you have to educate the media. You also need to educate the legislators. So I spend a lot of time talking to various task forces and policy groups and lawmakers. Sometimes even when I was pregnant, I'm on at midnight to Queensland and I'm giving a presentation to 30 people just before they're going to announce a task force. And then it goes to their premiere and then they decide coercive control will be a crime. That happened within days of me presenting. 
You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. I do these things all behind the scenes, but a lot of it I also want to be up front to, on a podcast where people, it's very intimate when you're podcasting and you're in someone's ears. Mm. And I hear from people all across the world who say that I helped them. I helped them understand what was happening. And equally, you want legislators to think we've got a gap in our criminal justice system or our process here, and we need to do more about A, B and C. So actually, I'm covering pretty much most mediums now. But I do think podcasting it is a very intimate medium. And of course, it's a very popular medium now. What are some of the goals that you think we should have here in the U.S. in terms of domestic violence and stalking reform? Because I know you've worked with it a lot in the U.K. And every time you have a victory, I'm so proud and so happy. What do we need to be doing here better? Oh, thank you. Yes, I, you know, there's good practice all across the world. But what I will say is I was quite shocked to see that sexual harassment has only just become a crime in the military. I don't know how that has happened. So that has been a real surprise to me. For example, in the UK, when you have a sexual harassment law, it applies everywhere in every workforce. It doesn't matter what uniform or badge you might have. But I think pertaining to domestic violence specifically, coercive control does need to be criminalized in all parts of the world. The main reason being that if you wait until a physical assault happens, then it's already gone too far because physical abuse only tends to be used when all other tactics are no longer working. And the coercive control is what keeps someone entrapped. It's what the psychological and the emotional, it's the drip. It's actually far more corrosive and insidious. It's what victims and survivors tell me harms them the most. And the other part to it is it correlates with femicide and familicide, with children being killed and women being killed. And it sits right now outside the arm of the criminal justice system. So you can have a thousand cuts before, you know, the actual big event that might be the murder. Often that's exactly what I see. Too often law enforcement will say things like, she didn't have any bruises or there weren't any broken bones. And just think about R. Kelly. That's exactly what a sheriff said. Oh, I did a welfare check. The girls seem to be fine. I didn't see any bruises. No one's been harmed. But of course, the harm is it's inside psychological, your head. right? Yeah, yeah. emotional. Yeah. And victims will say you can't put a bandage around the wounds that happen. So I think coercive control, absolutely. We've got it within family law in California. I gave evidence in Connecticut, in Hawaii. There are lots of states talking about it, but they need to be doing more and having more advocates who actually advocate for victims. And I think that's a very important part. And law enforcement who actually understand coercive control and prosecutors once you've got the legislation in. So the training program is huge. So I think there's a huge amount still to do here in America and also in Australia and other parts of the world and still in the UK. Just because you have a law come in, it doesn't mean to say everything's working beautifully. Resources are really the most important thing and resources that go in the right pockets of the actual people who are doing the work. Do you think the structure of the United States where we have these 50 quasi-independent states make moving laws like this forward that much more difficult? Because in the UK, for example, you've made some significant strides, but they're at the what would be the equivalent of the federal level. I'm very proud of the fact that you're moving forward here in Connecticut, where I now live, and California and elsewhere. But are we going to have to do this times 50? It feels that way at the moment, and the same in Australia. And what I've been saying in both places is you need a federal law. It's not just specific to Connecticut or California. You need a federal law, and you want it to be consistent and uniform, and the same with Australia. And you've got some states who are moving forward much quicker, namely because they've had some really horrific high-profile cases. I've got petitions in both places as well that people can sign. But yes, I do think that's a hindrance. I mean, in the UK, it was piecemeal. I changed the law first in England and Wales. And in fact, it was the shortest of my law reform campaigns. It took a year, 12 months. And I was told by parliamentarians that's the most successful campaign in terms of its timescale as well. But then the law had to change in Scotland and in Ireland and Northern Ireland. So UK isn't just there's one law for each 
a country. But of course, as I'm always saying, perpetrators travel and it makes sense to have consistency and continuity. Otherwise, they will finagle their way between the gaps. And that's what happens. And so the same needs to apply in America. And that makes it much more difficult until you reach a tipping point where someone says that the legislative at the federal level, actually, this should be federal. And it should. With the domestic violence laws here, most are seen in terms of domestic violence crimes as misdemeanors, as something minor. They're not something minor. If you do that to the person you're meant to love and care for the most, what are you prepared to do to someone you don't care about? So the accountability piece is really important. It's not easy in such a vast, but I think if anyone's going to do it, Biden probably will. And bringing back the Violence Against Women and Girls Act and ensuring that we've got people talking about women in the right way specifically, and that we haven't got a misogynist leading the country. Definitely, things are definitely improved. But there's still a lot of work to do. You're the first person that ever used the expression coercive control in a conversation with me. This is several years ago. And now I'm hearing that expression and that discussion happen much more frequently than ever before. Does it feel good for you to be talking about something and emphasizing its importance for years and then to begin to feel like maybe the tide is turning Some opinion leaders are actually embracing these important concepts. Absolutely. And there was three feminist psychologists who actually coined the term, and they were talking about three separate clients. And they were saying what they're experiencing, it's like a kind of hostage taking, like they've been kidnapped, but mentally it's like a coercion, a coercive control. So yes, they coined the term, I guess I popularized it by applying it in training and getting people talking about it, but then really pushing for the legislation. It was my organization, Paladin, that started the law reform campaign, the National Stalking Advocacy Service, after we changed the law on stalking. And the whole emphasis around it for me was the fact that with stalking law, I'd made it clear when I sat and met the lawyers who were drafting the legislation, it must say in the legislation, it's a pattern, i.e. two or more behaviours, it's a pattern, it must be clear. With domestic violence, A, it wasn't criminalised, and B, everyone talked about the incident, like it's a one-off thing that happens. That completely flies in the face that this is pattern behaviour. By the time someone calls the police, you've probably got 100 plus behaviours that have happened. So the criminal justice system, the framework always talks about the incident. The officer was called to the incident. It was a 911. They went to the incident. So this word is a problem. So even with words and what you put in your legislation, it really matters. Some of it's up to interpretation, but a lot of it actually is about the key word that is within that legislation. So now people are talking about it. Just before I jumped on with you, I was reading an article about a new show coming out on Netflix, The Tinder Swindler, and it mentioned love bombing and gaslighting and coercive control. Years ago, that would never be. But now people talk about it. Oh, they love bomb me. And I just want to cheer because I've popularized the language so people can, they know what it is. They can name it. And when you can name it, you feel empowered actually. And then another person understands or says, what's love bombing? What's gaslighting? These are all the tools and tactics of someone who coercively controls. And We've seen the show Seduced by Cecilia Peck that talks about the cult by Nexium, where coercive control is used. The more we talk about it and show the different manifestations of it, serial killers use it, cult leaders use it, dictators use it, presidents, I'm going, (laughs) but it's true that narcissists use it and dictators, that you're gaslit and your reality is distorted. So yes, Bill, it feels really good. And More and more people need to be talking about it, but getting it into podcast shows and everything else, I cheer every time someone says it or when I see it written or where someone flags it to me. I'm so glad that you mentioned Paladin because I want to make sure that we get into that a little bit more. How did Paladin actually come about? What was the impetus for that? Talk a little bit about that and the work that you do with them. Yes, so Paladin was my other baby that I founded in the wake of really changing the law on stalking. When you talk to the media and you talk about stalking, and I always brought in, unfortunately, victims who had suffered from stalking to explain it, because cases, people do need to hear them and understand how horrific the behaviour is and the psychological impact when it happens. But what that means is when you talk to the media or you're on a podcast, of course, more victims come forward because now they understand that this is stalking. I was being inundated. I had so many people reach out. 
I didn't know what to do. I was one person. One person can't talk and email and get the message out of here's some advice of what you should do for all these people's cases. It seemed obvious there was a gap. We didn't have a service that helped victims of stalking specifically. We had a helpline, which I'd helped set up in 2010 in the UK, the first one in the world, but they didn't have advocates. They would give on one-stop advice. But let's say your case was going, now it's a stalking case and it's going to court. Actually, you should have an advocate there with you to be your voice and to help you navigate the system. So I created Paladin and it's really the one-stop shop center of excellence in the UK where there are trained Isaacs, they're independent stalking advocacy case workers. And I created a university accredited position. So they go to their Isaac training and they get accredited by a university. They are a specialist and I wanted to prefer professionalize what they do. It's a great one-stop shop. You can go online. There's lots of advice on the website. And it might be that you're the victim of stalking. It might be that someone that you know is the victim of stalking, but it is a very niche, specific behavior. It does need a very unique and specific response when you have a stalker because the fixated and obsessive behavior doesn't just stop on its own. So you really need people who understand what's happening, can understand the risk level And the idea behind it is to really stop stalkers from stealing lives and taking lives and to empower victims and to be there, really bring the femicide rate down because these are the cases that are most likely going to result in a murder. And rarely do people even use that word stalking, which is also what I wanted to change, that people owned what what they were doing, what was happening, but they had a name and they didn't just think it was celebrities that were stalked, that it can happen to normal people. And they need a good response. They need people to help them and advocate for them when it happens. So that's where Paladin came from. Of course, we'll include all of the links in the show notes. So if someone needed more information about how to deal with stalking and these issues, they'd go to paladin.com and start with the website? Yeah, paladin.co.uk. Oh, sorry. It's a UK-based service, but Mm -hmm. they will signpost elsewhere. But there isn't anything equivalent here. We know that over 7 million people are stalked every year in the US, and there's no one where you can have a trained advocate to give you advice. So there is a gap here. There's a resource service, which is online, and you can go and have a look at that. And that's here in America, but they don't have trained advocates and it's not a telephone service, whereas Paladin is a national service. But they do signposts across the world when they get other cases coming in. They help as much as they can. What's the origin of the name? I've never asked you that before. Where does Paladin come from? It's French. It's from the protectors of the realm, so to protect those. So yes, whenever I worked in the Met, all my units had a name. I had Athena Minerva from the goddess Roman and Greek, the protector of the citadel, a female empowerment. Yes, I've always had the name has always meant something. It does what it says on the tin. I see Kristen is grinning, and I am too, because we love to hear about female empowerment and women developing and understanding their own power and how they can begin to address these things and not just accept these behaviors, abuses, without beginning to realize I'm not alone and that this is happening to millions of people across the country and across the world. Absolutely. It's unfortunate. But then when you look at, I don't know if you've both seen the show Black and Missing uh, with Nat, Natalie and Derricka Wilson, yes. f- incredible female advocates. And I have to say, women do get shit done. There's incredible advocates all across yeah. the world. And a lot of these advocacy services are set up by women who've experienced something and they are, have become a force for good. Most oftentimes, those who have set these things up have had post-traumatic growth And then they've created something to help other people because they don't want someone else to experience what they have. They see that that gap, they see what's required. So yeah, I'm all about, even on Crime Analyst, a lot of it is giving people information to empower them to be an advocate, to stand up, to find your voice and to speak your truth. By the way, I want to be clear here. I don't mean to short anyone else. We know that abuse comes in many different forms and is directed at a lot of different people. I don't mean for anyone to think that we're only concentrating on one group of people. Lots of different people need assistance in terms of dealing with abusive factors in their lives. Well, they do. But the one thing I will say is a lot of abuse is gendered and it does come down to sex in the main. And we are talking about male violence to women 
most often times, which again, you know, when I worked in the FBI and other places, we're sat there talking about a case. Most often times it's violence against a woman. Most of the time it's men that are talking about what's gone on and a woman's experience. Mm-hmm. And that's a problem for me. Because why I also set up crime analysts is because I think you have to have a female POV. And I think that women experience things that are so nuanced that a man just never would. And I'll give you an example. Umberto's six foot five. He has never had to think (laughs) about walking out at night. He has never had to think, can I go running or can I do this? And when I explain to him how I risk assess everything in my life, he has been absolutely astounded. Yeah. Every woman nods when I say that. And I'm yes. looking at yep. Kristen now. No. We carry our keys in, in our knuckles ready to yep. stab someone when we go out walking yep. to take our dog out for a wee at 9 p.m. Men don't live like that. Women do. So I think it's really important to make that very clear that we have different experiences in terms of the world and women have had to live our lives risk assessing everything. And we're taught it at a very young age, not to go down that alleyway, not to go out late at night, not to say something that someone's looking at us to, if we go out, cover our drink because someone might slip something in it. All these things that are just nuanced behavior. Then when we report that something's happened, then we're not believed And it's like, you've just given us all this crime prevention advice of what we should do. And it always comes back loaded on women. So I think there is a nuanced difference between experiences, male and female. I should say, it's not that I think, it's that I know, because I've lived it as a woman and I've worked the cases that tells me. And when Jim and I work cases, I will see things that are very different, very nuanced to my female experience than he will. And that's what actually also makes a very good team people's different experiences, bringing it in and listening to somebody else's experience and understanding that they may have a different POV because they've lived something or they've experienced it. Without personalizing this too much, Kristen and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I'm very proud of the fact that Kristen's out. She's got set herself a goal of running a 5k race every month this year. So she's out training and running. She came back from a run the other day and talked to me about it and I think you mentioned it on social media as well, Kristen. Yeah. People were morons or are catcalling to I you. I got catcalled and followed down the followed down the road. And you do. It's like you said, Laura, you have to risk assess. Okay, are these morons who've been catcalling me, are they going to turn around and come right back after me? Mm-hmm. How long can I safely go jogging for? Do I need to turn around and go back to my neighborhood? Am I going to be able to run fast enough if I go back to my neighborhood? Do I have enough battery in my phone? It is. It's the sort of thing that you worry about. I would venture that most of the men in my neighborhood who are going running don't have to deal with some idiot catcalling and then following them down the street. Yeah. And the cognitive load that we get from having to think like that. And I also will share with you that when I was pregnant, I was catcalled more than I ever have been. What? And had creepy wow. men driving up to me and slowing their cars down. I have to say, I felt incredibly vulnerable. Oh my God. Incredibly vulnerable, even more yeah. so being pregnant. I hated going anywhere on my own because of that. Oh Whereas God. when I'm not pregnant, I'm always fit. I take care of myself. I'm very aware but I knew pregnant, I couldn't run. I couldn't get out of harm's way if someone oh, did God. want to do something. Oh my and it gosh. really, yeah, it's shocking actually, Bill, because it was something that I didn't expect. And then I read a quote by Gloria Steinem that, where she said something like, why would I get pregnant? I wouldn't be able to run. And it just oh, wow. hit me. Yeah. I would go out for a walk and take yeah. sometimes be, sometimes not. And suddenly a creepy man comes out of an alleyway early in the morning. I know I can't run. So I ended up taking a weapon with me. It's a horrible position where when you're pregnant, you should feel great and you should feel taken care of. But I actually had more men do creepy things to me across that time where wow. I felt incredibly vulnerable. I am, Oh, my God. I'm actually just shocked. As horrible a world as we sometimes live in that just seems so disgusting and shocking that someone would approach you in that way you get the sense that pregnant women are revered and should be respected and treated with extra care and this is precisely the opposite. This is really twisted. Wow. It was very shocking to me, I must admit. And some of those men may have just been carrying on like they normally do, just with no 
realization of the impact that it makes you feel when you are not able to defend yourself. And more so, of course, my baby's welfare was the number one priority. But yes, why I share it is because these are real experiences and I want people to understand the female experience and why I advocate for women specifically Mm. is because we have been forgotten along the way that even though most crime shows and sadly most murders, we mainly are talking about women being killed. But somehow our voices get lost in the ether. And I'll say to you, even with Sarah Everard's case, the police officer using his police powers to coerce her under the grounds that he was arresting her due to a COVID breach. A police and crime commissioner actually came out on record and said, maybe she should have thought of desisting from arrest or maybe she should have screamed. I have to say, I jumped on social media immediately because, again, we go straight into victim blame of what a woman, she should have desisted and she should have remonstrated arrest. Don't be so ridiculous. These are just other ways of coming up with a way to blame a woman for a man's behavior. He lost his job over that comment. And quite rightly, Mm. that's what women deal with every day. The mental gymnastics that people go through to blame a woman for the situation that she has found herself in rather than look at male violence being a problem. And we have to name it. We have to name it because that's who we are fearful of. Because quite frankly, when I'm walking out, I don't know who are the goodies and who are the baddies in a snap decision. When you're just going about your business to go to the shop or when you're going running, Kristen doesn't know if they're just messing about and actually it's a bit of fun. They're not going to follow her any further. She doesn't know that. She has to make a decision that to keep myself safe, I have to either go home or I have to go down this other road, whatever it might be, because we don't know whether they mean business or not. And we have to make those decisions in the blink of an eye every day. That's what I'm talking about. And we can't disconnect it when we have true crime and real crime podcasts. Let's get real about who's experiencing what and from whom. Who is creating that? Because women live on a daily basis with these things that they're loaded up of all the things that we have to do and what we have to think about. Don't wear the short skirt. Don't wear that top. It's too revealing. Don't have your hair like that. Don't wear that lipstick. It's too red. Don't leave your drink there. Make sure you get an Uber home. What if you get an Uber? Does someone know that you're in the Uber? Call someone Mm -hmm. so that they know you're leaving. Call them when you get home too. Yes. Can you see how the list is just so great for what we do every day? And most women don't even think about it. We just do it. But when you say it to a man, and I'm looking at your face, men are just like, (laughs) wow, that's a lot that you're having to do right there. That's just a normal evening out. Join us again next time as we continue our fascinating conversation with Laura Richards, Scotland Yard trained criminologist, host of the Crime Analyst podcast, and co-host of Real Crime Profile. Thanks again for listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.